we will get started with today's program. And I'd really like to welcome everyone by saying how grateful I am to be teaching, living, and learning on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations here where the Oceanwise head office is in Vancouver at the Vancouver Aquarium. And that it's by learning from those best practices of looking after the land that we are living on that really helps to inform how Oceanwise research, conservation, and education shapes our programs like this one today for you. And so to share a little bit about this special Ocean Awards lecture series, I'd like to turn it over to Carlos. So take it away, Carlos. Thank you, Danica. It's really a pleasure uh, for me to be here with you all today. The Ocean Awards were founded in 1995, and it's really a celebration to those at the forefront of ocean sciences and conservation. And the work that they do through research, education, action, leadership, and philanthropy. The Ocean Awards are conducted this year online for good reasons. And uh, we heard from North Medal winner, Dr. David Suzuki in June. And for the next six weeks, uh, we will also have weekly talks from other winners. Uh, the schedule and information about those other winners is found online under research.ocean.org. But today, really, we are gathered here to celebrate the Coastal Guardian Watchmen, the winners of the 2019 Conservation Leadership Award in support of social responsibility. The awards committee recognized the inherent and profoundly important value of the Coastal Guardian Watchmen and the way in which they have contributed to a more sustainable coastal ocean. We present this award in recognition of leadership on ancestral traditional territories and the invaluable work that they have done as stewards of natural and cultural resources in the ocean. The Coastal Guardian Watchmen play a critical role in all aspects of stewardship for First Nations along BC's north and Central Coast and the Haida Gwaii, ensuring that the resources are sustainably managed, that the rules and regulations are followed, and that the land and marine use agreements are implemented effectively. Now, British Columbia, with its, uh, what is it, 945,000 square kilometers, is very similar in size to my home country, Colombia, at the northern tip of South America and with uh, shores both on the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. My Colombia, uh, if I may call it mine, was colonized by Spanish conquerors in 1525. Colombia has almost 3,000 kilometers of coastline, and that is in sharp contrast to the BC coastline, which is over 25,000 kilometers long, almost 10 times the length of the Colombian coastline. I have learned that there are about 70 First Nation coastal communities in BC. In Colombia, where I come from, indigenous territories comprise 31% of the surface of the country, divided among 87 First Nations. The majority of them live in the Amazon and Orinoco river basins. Those are really inland. And their key role in the custody of primary rainforests and its resources and cultural values is undisputed. For me, as a lover of the oceans, it's very heartening to learn about the extraordinary role of the Coastal Guardian Watchmen in the responsible custody of the oceans here in Canada. I have learned, and I only arrived to Canada uh, eight months ago, that First Nations consume up to 15% more seafood than the average Canadian, and that there is a profound spiritual and cultural connection to the oceans underpinning their sustainable management of marine resources. That's a true commitment with future generations. The Coastal Guardian Watchmen uphold and enforce traditional and contemporary indigenous laws passed down over countless generations. And they work together to monitor, protect, and restore the cultural and natural resources of their territories, creating a united presence for stewardship along the coast. In 2005, stewardship leaders from the nations formed the Coastal Stewardship Network. This network is a regional initiative, and it's supported by Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative, which is an alliance of uh, the following First Nations and councils, the Haida, the Masit, Skidigit, Mitlikatla, 
Gitgat, Kitasun, High Highs, Helsak, New Hawk, and Winikinau. And uh, excuse my pronunciation errors if there were many. Uh, I am a poor Colombian that only arrived to Canada a few months ago. I'm learning. Although the Coastal Guardian Watchmen work together across the region as members of the Coastal Stewardship Network, each nation has a unique program that monitors and stewards its respective territory and carries on its own stewardship traditions. My warm congratulations again to the Coastal Guardian Watchmen for the 2019 Conservation Leadership Award in support of social responsibility. Over back to you, Danica. Wonderful, thank you so much, Carlos. Um, and now I am so excited to introduce our presenter today. I'd like to introduce Laura Hoshizaki, who is the program manager of the Coastal Stewardship Network, or CSN, a program of Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative. Since 2005, the CSN has supported member nation stewardship offices and Coastal Guardian Watchmen as they work together to protect and manage their ancestral territories. Laura holds a Master's of Science in Resource Management and Environmental Studies from the University of British Columbia, and throughout her academic and professional career has developed an expertise in conservation planning, field-based monitoring, data governance, and data management. And so we're so lucky to be joined by you today, Laura, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Danica. Thank you, Carlos. Um, so, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. I guess I'll just start off by saying, unfortunately, I, you, I'm sure I, I'm not the face you were all expecting to see. Uh, Ross Wilson was supposed to be joining me today, but unfortunately, he was called away at the last minute um, and sends his regrets. So, um, it will be me speaking about the Guardian Watchmen, and I'm looking forward to sharing uh, with you stories of our program and stories of the Guardians. And and thank you very much for uh, for this award. It's greatly appreciated. So, um, I guess I should share my screen now. Oh, right. I, this is why we practice, right? Gotcha. Um, okay. Does this look all right now? Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about the Guardian Watchmen. The, the format of this talk will be speaking a little bit at the beginning about Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative, a brief, brief history, then dive into the Coastal Guardian Watchmen themselves, the kind of work that they do, the vision of the program uh, initially, some of the more recent work that we've undertaken, and then I'll um, go back to the regional scope and look at the Coastal Stewardship Network, who we were formerly known as the Coastal Guardian Watchmen Network. And so I'll speak a little bit about how the network works to support Guardian Watchmen on the ground. Um, so today uh, we are, or <laughs> I'm coming from uh, Coast Salish Territory. I'm living here in Vancouver. Uh, Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative is an alliance of North Coast, Central Coast, and Haida Gwaii. So specifically, we work with the Council of the Haida Nation, Old Masset, and Skidigat Band Councils. We work with the Metlakatla Nation, Kitkatla Nation, Gitgat, the Kitisuhehe, the Heltsuk, the Nuhok and the Uwikino. And so these nations came together in 2003 originally to work together sort of with ma two major pillars. One, uh, working together to protect the environment and conservation efforts, and also to develop sustainable economies in their communities and enhance in general their community well-being. So with the declaration, the nations committed to making decisions that were uh, ensuring the well-being of their lands and waters to preserve and renew the territories, cultures and tradition of knowledge and authority and being honest with each other and respectful of all life. So today, Coastal First Nations is an um, organization that has many different programs within it. So working on land stewardship issues, marine and ocean planning, uh, energy, climate change work, and the Coastal Stewardship Network is a program within that umbrella. 
Um, so the Coastal Stewardship Network, <laughs> as I mentioned, was the Coastal Guardian Watchman Network at first. And so who are the Coastal Guardian Watchmen? As uh, many of you are here are probably quite interested in this work and may already know some of the um, have been familiar. I saw Alejandro's name in the in the attendees, so you'll know lots about this work already, Alejandro. Um, but really, the Coastal Guardian Watchmen, um, I should say they're led and employed directly by their individual nation and their stewardship office. So each nation has their own guardian watchman program that they uh, work with and that they employ. And the guardians are really working in their territories on behalf of their own nation and their own stewardship office. They obviously play a critical role in all aspects of the stewardship from a coastal First Nations regional perspective. But ultimately, I think it's important to note that the guardians are, are really carrying out their individual nation's efforts um, to protect their territory, but are working together as coastal guardian watchmen across the region. So they're on the land upholding, enforcing traditional and contemporary Indigenous laws, as well as generally monitoring, protecting, and restoring the resources of their territories. So you can see the, the boat there with the Coastal Guardian Watchman symbol, all of the boats, and they have uh, uniforms as well to just show their presence on the land and the water. So a big part of the work of Coastal Guardian Watchmen is to be the presence on it, like I say, the presence in the land and the waters. So in many of the areas that the guardians are working in, they're often um, quite underserved by other agencies. And so they're the first to be called when there's an emergency out on the water, when people need help, um, and they're doing a lot of emergency response work. Um, but they're also there to obviously ensure that the resources are sustainably managed. So they're the eyes and the ears of all of these land and marine use agreements that get signed. They're the ones that are actually keeping an eye on what's happening in the patrol or while they're doing their patrols. And they're enforcing the rules and regulations, and they're often doing this through public education. So that's a huge role of guardians. Guardian Watchmen um, is to share their role and their knowledge um, of regulations, both from colonial governments, so federal, provincial governments, as well as their own nation's governments. And so educating the public and using that as a way of, of ensuring that people are out respecting the territories and respecting the rules of the land and waters. So this is an example of sort of uh, the difference of presence between Guardian Watchmen and other enforcement agencies. So this map is on the left is the Kitisu Hehe's Guardian Watchmen patrols in a season. So these lines represent all of the areas that the Guardians have gone around in their in their boats, um, and it's com contrasted to the lines on the right, which is the green lines. Those are BC Parks patrols. So really, we're saying that these are uh, the Guardians are the ones that are sort of out there and act for most, um, in, especially in the areas of the central coast, um, where there isn't a lot of presence from other authorities. So if there are people in trouble, if there's a spill, if there's a whale that's been um, entangled by a net, there are the ones that are there to, to um, be first on the scene. So another large part of their work um, outside of public education and being sort of the um, authority on the water is also doing a lot of work to support scientific uh, research and decision making and management. So they are often collecting a lot of data. So here you can see them. They participate in a lot of crab surveys. Um, and they're often collecting data to support other scientific research as well as uh, management decisions that are happening out of their stewardship offices. They also enforce fishery closures to safeguard populations of, of, um, of species that are particularly important to their nation. So the Dungeness crab being an example of that. Um, and so they're doing this on the water, but they're also doing this on the land. So uh, they've also, in many cases, been participating in a lot of bear research, especially looking at the effects of ecotourism and other factors on the populations of bears. So they do this through non-invasive techniques like setting up snags to collect hair samples and using motion sensor cameras. There was also a project recently with uh, Bird Studies Canada where the Guardian Watchmen set out motion sensor cameras to look out for invasive mammals on some islands um, and thinking about the impact of these invasive mammals on important bird areas. So really, um, I think the other thing to note too with the Guardian is that they do these this um, these work this work and these scientific projects that go on for many many years and there's a, often um, a sort of continuity with the people that are working out of the offices in the nations that maybe is absent in other kinds of research or other um, government agencies too. 
So in addition to being on the marine side and the land, they're also doing freshwater work. So you can see that the work of Guardian Watchmen is pretty broad and they really kind of do it all. Um, so another uh, big chunk of work that's happening actually right now, especially is doing creek walks to monitor salmon populations. So this will be um, collecting information on uh, salmon return counts and re really recognizing that salmon are the lifeblood of communities and ecosystems. And so the data that's collected in these areas is they're often looking at streams that aren't seen by other office, other kinds of regulation agencies, other DFO agencies like that, as I say, and they're collecting this information to really support their stewardship offices to do evidence based decision making. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of reports that we've put together specifically on the value of Guardian Watchmen and the, the programs. Um, I did send along the links. So these reports are publicly available, so you can actually access them. And I've sent along the links too, so hopefully those will be uh, distributed. So the first report I wanted to highlight is the Guardian Watchmen business case. So this was done in 2016. And it assessed the value in economic terms of guardian programs and the benefits of guardian programs on their communities. So we looked at a bunch of different values, including sort of the economic opportunities that having guardian programs provide, as well as supporting cultural well-being, governance authority, and in general, just protecting the lands and waters and the ancestral territories of their nations. Oh, thank you. So the link has just gone in the chat I see there. So. And this has shown that really the return on investment, so for every dollar that's put into these programs, the communities reap between 10 and $20 back. Um, it really shows the spectrum of benefits and the value of these programs to the communities. It's work we're quite proud of. Um, and then secondly, the Guardian Watchman Strategic Plan. So we just uh, released this last month, I guess two months ago. <laughs> um, and this is the strategic plan. It's, it's a long-term strategic plan, and it's really the culmination of many years of work and, and um, that the Coastal Guardian Watchman programs have been focused on together. It's based on a lot of in-depth conversations amongst the CFN member nations and their stewardship leaders, and it outlines eight major pillars of work that we want to do together across the region for to support Coastal Guardian Watchmen. So those eight programs or eight strategic priorities, I should say the first being um, really focusing on the roles and the responsibilities of Coastal Guardian Watchmen. So as you can see, Guardians, as I mentioned, they do so much work and, and it's so broad that we really are trying to hone in on looking at specialized rules and what is the, the role of a guardian watchman and how do we want to frame those in terms of looking at new guardian watchmen and looking at um, expanding the role or, or honing on, in on specialized roles of guardian watchmen. Uh, the second strategic priority is thinking about mandates and safeguards. So this relates to the sort of authority aspect of guardian watchmen programs and recognizing that they are working on the mandate of their leadership in their individual nation. And so honing in on, on the development and the formalization of those mandates. And the third is around compliance and enforcement. So I mentioned a lot about the work that they do on the on the territory and how they enforce both uh, colonial laws and their traditional laws. Um, and so there's a lot of work that we've done already around training for that, but um, we want to obviously in, uh, continue down that road of compliance and enforcement and formalize that uh, formalize that role even more. Um, so the fourth <laughs> strategic priority would be around environmental monitoring. So recognizing this is a lot of the work that guardians are doing right now is around environmental monitoring and supporting da data um, collection and the research uh, aspects that are going through. Uh, the fifth is around training and professional development, which I'll talk a little bit more. So there's obviously training is a pivotal part, um, a critical part, sorry, of all of these pieces. Uh, the sixth is around uh, advancement and retention. So we want to think about when a person wants to become a Coastal Guardian Watchman or watch person, what does that look like? How can, what's the trajectory of this career? How can they move through um, and potentially grow within that career? And how do we ensure that the people that come into these positions are retained by their stewardship offices as well and help to grow the capacity of the stewardship offices? So the seventh is, again, a capacity building. So not just in a nation level, but on a regional level is around how do we build capacity 
capacity um, both regionally to support these programs working together, but at a nation level. And then finally, the major strategic priority is around funding for these programs. So we um, are always <laughs> funding is always an issue, as I'm sure won't be a surprise for anyone. But thinking about sustainable long term funding for these programs, I think that oftentimes um, people aren't necessarily aware that the Guardian Watchmen programs are funded individually by their nations and they're often done with sort of pieces of funding here and there um, and that uh, we rely a lot on Coastal Guardian Watchmen to be doing this work, but there isn't necessarily uh, long term funding in place to support these programs year round and that there are actually very few programs that have um, year round Guardian Watchmen that are able to do this work. So. Okay, so then <laughs> the Coastal Stewardship Network. Sorry, I didn't expect to do this whole presentation on my own. So, <laughs> so here we are. Uh, the Coastal Stewardship Network. So as I said, the Stewardship Network actually began as the Coastal Guardian Watchman Network um, in 2005, and we changed our name in 2013 to reflect just the how the stewardship offices in general were growing and expanding, and we were working to serve not just Guardian Watchmen, but also sort of the stewardship offices around them more generally. That being said, a lot of our work today as a network is still um, focused on Guardian Watchmen and supporting Guardian and watchmen and the goal of the network is really to strengthen CFN stewardship capacity and authority. So we support guardian watchmen. I'll talk about sort of four main ways that we do that right now. We support their data collection and information management through the regional monitoring system. We deliver customized stewardship training programs and we host annual gatherings and learning exchanges for the guardians, as well as create uh, a lot of communications materials and support sort of the branding, the look, the feel, the, the presence of that, like I say, that unified presence that the guardians have across the coast. So on the regional monitoring system, the RMS is a standard uh, provides standard methodologies and guidelines for collecting data. It does that through a customized uh, data collection app we call the Coast Tracker, and so this is something that we've developed in house, and it holds forms. Um, so each Pro, or each nation kind of uses the same methodologies and protocols for collecting data, so that the information can be aggregated and used across the region. The information is collected on offline by the guardians, and then when they're back into their office, they can upload it and it goes to a centralized database that's on a server here in Canada. That's also kind of important, well, not kind of very important to us. Um, and it's held in the database to protect that nation's information. So we have a web based data management system for analysis, planning and decision making guardians and their managers can then go on online, sign in to the platform and look at the data that's been collected review that, download it, use it for their own purposes, as well as um, working together uh, across the region. Um, for training, so our flagship training program is the Stewardship Technician Training Program. It's a partnership with Vancouver Island University, and we've been running it in different iterations since around 2000 and 2013. Uh, it's a two year program. Oops, it's a cohort model, not a mode. <laughs> so this means that we work uh, with, we bring together students from all of our different communities and they go through the program together in a, in a group cohort that really develops into a family. They take courses uh, around natural resource management, environmental monitoring, leadership skills. The picture here, they're working on small motor repair. That's another popular course because the guardians are out and often are dealing with motor issues in the boats. Um, we recently did a STTP evaluation, so that's another report we're looking forward to releasing to the public. It's just going through its final rounds of edits, but we did a very thorough evaluation of this program by interviewing students, faculty members, instructors, coordinators to just to think about, you know, as this program has been developed, what have we learned? What are the lessons we can share with other Indigenous Guardian programs and how do we want to improve our training moving forward? So it was, um, yeah, it was a great evaluation and we're looking forward to sharing that out as well too. Oh, this is a great photo of the guardians and their uh, graduation. <laughs> so this is the cohort two um, of the stewardship technician training program. Um, 
Nice to see their smiling faces. <laughs> uh, that's sorry, I should say that's Blair Hands, that's Evan Edgars and Jonas and Rob Brown and Jordan and <laughs> Nicole and Patrick Johnson and Roger Harris and Alex Lilly. <laughs> All right. Oop. There you go. Um, so the other kinds of we offer other training in addition to the STTP and it's more sort of focus in community and, and um, for each guardian group. We've been doing a lot of work recently on safety policies and procedures um, with Raven Rescue. Um, so that is really developing comprehensive safety policies and programs to ensure that the guardians are safe when they're out on the water. Um, we also do in community training with the ex conservation officer around compliance and enforcement skills and, and primarily around communication, what it looks like to be approaching boats, going through regulations, that kind of thing. Forestry monitoring, archaeology, cultural heritage, Heritage. These are all sort of parts of advanced training that we're offering, um, as well as emergency response. Um, another piece that came to mind is that whale disentanglement, too, uh, is some other training that we've done. We have also, as I said, we're kind of expanding outside of just focusing on guardian watchmen, but we're looking at guardian coordinators and managers as well, and um, developing capacity in project management, administration, and general sort of management skills like HR and finance, too. Um, networking and collaboration, this is a big part. This is, I think, the um, one of the major sort of benefits of working as a collective of the Coastal Guardian Watchmen are building these relationships um, amongst different guardian programs along the coast. And so, um, especially now, I think during COVID and this pandemic and how isolated a lot of us all are, the being able to talk with one another on a regular basis has been really helpful. Um, and also for the guardians to share sort of how they're dealing with the pandemic in each of their communities, how they're able to still kind of get out on the water and do so in a safe way too has been really helpful. And so our team facilitates meetings um, and monthly conference calls for the Guardian Watchmen. Um, we also have an annual gathering. Unfortunately, we weren't able to have it this year, but in the past we have um, had an annual gathering, usually in uh, collaboration with Hakai Research Institute. Um, and that gathering brings us all together to share ideas and lessons learned. Um, we also coordinate learning exchanges with other Indigenous Guardian groups. So this photo is uh, of the Arctic Bay Guardian guardians from uh, Nunavut and uh, the Newhawk Guardian Watchmen in Bella Coola. And so this uh, was last fall that um, the Arctic Bay Guardians came down to Bella Coola. And this previous spring, the Bella Coola, uh, the Newhawk Guardian had gone up to Arctic Bay. And so a bit more on the annual gathering, like I say, with when we meet at Hakai, this is uh, where gives the guardians an opportunity to share community updates and just share ideas and lessons learned and we also offer in-person training so in the past we've done emergency response training with the canadian coast guard we've done whale disentanglement with uh, nature united and we've done tactical communications with bc parks officers as well so it offers an opportunity to do in-person training all together as well as kind of share successes and challenges and and really build those relationships too, I think can't be understated. Um, and then finally, we offer communication support. So we uh, have a newsletter, which you can sign up for on our website. Um, we've also been working on, on uh, uh, some new videos that we're excited to be sharing out soon enough to um, and then really just sharing the stories uh, with the public of the Guardian Watchmen and the work that they do. So thanks very much also for this opportunity to share with you all a little bit about the hard work that the Guardian are doing uh, on the ground. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, a, that's about all I've got. <laughs> but, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that was fantastic. And you presented the entire presentation so spontaneously so well. So I really <laughs> appreciate it.
Um, we're definitely looking for questions from our audience. And so you can share those with us in the chat or in the Q&A. We'll be keeping an eye out for them there. And I know that Carlos most likely has a couple of questions to start us off and we'll be asking the questions to Laura in just a moment. So we'll see him joining us via video once again in just a minute. Thank you for that, Monica. Yes, uh, Laura, this is a fantastic presentation and really a tremendous amount of work uh, that you that you that, that you represented for uh, the coastal uh, initiatives uh, that this program is encompassing. I was very interested to hear that you mentioned the enforcement of fisheries closures. And uh, my question is whether these are self-imposed uh, closures uh, by the nations or whether these are regional or federal in origin. Mm, actually, I, I'm wondering if I can point that to Alejandro Freed that's on here. Alejandro, can I maybe I'll start to put, I'll, I'll speak a little bit, but I might put you on the spot because Alejandro is uh, working for the Central Coast Indigenous Resource Alliance that have been a big, uh, some leaders of those crab closures. So he could speak um, more to it. And we'll see if he does. Anyway, <laughs> I'll see if he's paying attention. Um, but yeah, so those. Oh. Anyway, I'll 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 just say that. Um, so those closures, it's often um, at first they were done as sort of experimental scientific closures that were undertaken by the nation with this research project happening on the central coast, um, and they've been done more on a voluntary basis, right? So the enforcement is happening on a voluntary basis for the the crabbers. Um, however, there have also been uh, times when that information was then. So this has been taking place for years really is doing these crab surveys and determining kind of control sites and um, and uh, and other management sites as well. Um, and then my understanding is that after that has been um, sorry, I'm, I keep looking at Alejandro because he really does know more of this than I do. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, that this information was also then brought to DFO and supported by DFO in doing that collaborative management decision making. Hi there, um, it's Alejandro. My video may or may not work, but uh, thanks uh, for the great presentation. I'll just add very briefly because, um, um, but uh, the work done by the by the guardians has been tremendous um, all along. And about the closure specifically, so yes, it's sorry on their traditional law. But what's really interesting is that um, uh, because of all the data collected, we built a really strong ecological conservation case that led to discussions with DFO. And much of these this has been legislated already as uh, commercial fishery closures on their uh, fishery management plan. So uh, in many ways, it's quite a nice example of um, how things that can start with a little bit of um, rumbles get, can turn into real collaborative. Um, uh, research and lead to legislative changes that integrate um, indigenous perspectives in modern fishery management. So I think of the crab work by the guardians as uh, one of the forerunners of what hopefully become a greater trend in fisheries management in Canada. Thank you. That's uh, fascinating. Thanks, Alejandro, for that. And there is uh, one, a few more questions are here. Uh, one is how has COVID impacted the work of the watchman actually, Lara? Um, yeah, COVID has had a, uh, so it's obviously been different in different communities. Um, at the very beginning, it, you know, most of, as you know, the coastal first nations communities have been, um, uh, basically closed down to visitors and people coming in and, and as smaller communities, especially had sort of stopped all travel coming in and out. And in some communities, guardian watchmen, uh, were, sh um, seen as being the protectors of that boundary and that barrier. And so whether that's kind of um, being present at checkpoints to ensure that people aren't coming into the communities or if they have to come into communities that they're aware of the different regulations that are going on. So in, in for some communities, guardian watchmen um, have sort of had that onto their plate and they're sort of, again, seen as those sort of first responders, the people on the ground to do that. Um, and in other communities, it has been challenging because they um, 
not they had to put the safety pro protocols in place to go out on the boats and to do that work. So some of the seasons have been suspended. A lot of other external research projects that also bring funding in the into the communities haven't been able to happen either. So it's been um, quite disruptive. On the positive side, um, Guardian crews have still been able to get out and and manage to be there um, uh, and doing the work on, on the ground. But it's had a major effect on them. Yeah. Thank you, Lara. Uh, yes, uh, very dramatic impacts also at Oceanwise and everywhere, wherever yeah. we uh, So it's no surprise that uh, th these communities have been impacted as well and the work of the Guardians in particular. In the interest of time, uh, I would like to propose we move uh, to the next speaker. Uh, Danica, would you like to introduce Ross? <laughs> Ross is not here today. <laughs> oh, you did, the, you did it for both. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well done. Well done. That's impressive. So then over to more questions to you, Lara, because uh, uh, we have another question here. Are you able to do anything to encourage more women to join the Guardian team? And is that considered important? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I. I think that is definitely considered important. I actually just had a great conversation with um, the Haida Fisheries manager, who's a, who's a woman, unfortunately, unable to make it today. Um, but there is definitely a desire to get more women interested in the work of guardians. Um, there are some guardian uh, watch people or watch women as well um, that are doing this work. Um, but I think it's something that um, is is definitely important. And, and when it's interesting um, to think of the role of women in this work and how when I actually think of the different stewardship offices and the people that are working, there are quite a few women that maybe aren't necessarily working um, as field officers, but are maybe um, either supervisors or lead crews coordinators, that kind of thing too. So there are quite a few women present in this work, um, but it is something that is seen as quite important and we've had a lot of discussions about how to get women more involved. I know there has been, um, there's been some interesting research done around the role of women in Indigenous Guardians programs across the globe, actually. We had an interesting visit from a woman from Australia recently that's been interviewing Guardian women programs across the globe. There's some great examples um, from uh, from Africa as well as, as um, I think it's from Zimbabwe, women-only Guardian programs there too, which we've learned a lot from. Yeah. Very interesting, these cross-fertilizations, because yes, I am familiar with some of those uh, in Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. from done some uh, some conservation work there as well and it's uh, fascinating there is one in particular that stands out which which is an anti poaching unit mm -hmm. uh, entirely of women uh the cobras i believe they're called uh oh, fantastic so uh, i have another question for you uh what is your thinking about uh, climate change and the mitigation of climate impacts as potentially one additional role, either in research or in adaptation, that Coastal Guardian Watchmen may 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 be interested to take on. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, that's actually, that's a great question. So as part of this stewardship technician training program, we also offer professional development seminars for all of the guardians that go through that program. And our last professional development workshop that we did, um, we asked the guardians sort of, what did you want to talk about? What are the themes you want to learn more about? And it was determined that uh, climate change was a major piece there. So we actually, um, I think we went back and, and started having great discussions with local experts as well and really recognizing that the guardians and their communities are, because of their because of how long <laughs> that these communities, ha um, you know, since the last at least 14,000 years, their relationship to the lands and waters and the depth of their connection to these areas is so strong that they are really the closest people to recognize change and to be sensitive to these changes. And so there's almost, um, there's actually some great, right? So, um, 
from Nancy Turner around this as well, um, around the the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the the almost in their in their makeup really to see and and be sensitive to these changes. So I think that inherently there is a particular sensitivity to being witnesses and monitors for change. That being um, in addition to that, obviously um, through things like the Marine Plan Partnership and there's a lot of climate change indicators and ecological monitoring that takes place through these plans and guardian watchmen are, are the ones to be doing that work and to be monitoring for um, from a more Western scientific uh, framework of, uh, of for climate change. Well, okay, so we, we have we have heard from you that there is definitely interest in expanding perhaps the understanding on climate change and those immediate challenges. That's great. And yeah. there's definitely a role to play. What else is out there in terms of the future of the Coastal Guardian program? What are other subjects or what do you see the Coastal Guardian uh, Watchman uh, being uh, in 2050? Mm, well, I think, you know, from the conversations that I've had and from chatting with people and and again the the conversations where when the guardians get together the thing I think that stands out the most for me right now is um, their desire to get more youth involved and to recognize um, that this is work that really needs to be carried through their gen and has been really passed on from generation to generation but really thinking about um, the younger generation and, and and because this the stewardship offices are relatively new in the communities, this sort of formal stewardship office administration, this kind of the thought that, you know, the, the job, the modern day understanding of the job of a guardian watchman is relatively new, right? The last say 15 years or so, right? 20 years. And so how can we develop this as a as the profession of guardian watchman in a way that is alluring for kids and is interesting and sees that as a as a pathway forward to be the professional stewards of their territories and to 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 really bring that home. So I think that's something that the guardians are really interested in doing and um, whether it be through, you know, there's a nature united supporting um, emerging Aboriginal stewards program, the seas program, um, and that brings a lot of new guardians in and, and we've had. Um, graduates from that SEAS program come to the stewardship technician training program and then become guardian watchmen and then mentor new guardian watchmen coming up too, right? So I think that's a that's a big part of the, the work. That is definitely very forward looking uh, and, and very much in line with uh, this notion that we need to really bring the next generation totally on board. Uh, yeah. And uh, as I think of uh, climate and ocean literate constituency that we need, uh, for for the oceans, then I'm very very heartened to hear uh, that this is also part of the plan uh, in the in the network. So that's fantastic. Could you please comment on any relationship between the Coastal Guardian Watchmen and the Canadian Coast Guard, uh, specifically perhaps on where the funding has come from since the onset of the program, but also uh, potential cross fertilization between both programs in terms of uh, technical knowledge. Yeah, um, so there's a few things I guess I could mention with uh, with respect to the Coast Guard. So as I did mention in the talk, the Coast Guard has um, worked with us a lot on different training. Um, so both at the regional level, they've come to our annual gatherings and done emergency preparedness training and emergency uh, response scenario training as well. But individual Guardian programs also work with the Coast Guard and they do um, sort of the riot training in Bamfield, which is the rigid Hull, it's a particular kind of boat training. So there is a lot of training that takes place through uh, between the Coast Guard and the Guardian Watchman programs. They've also, um, a few of the Guardian programs are also uh, now uh, understood as, or they have agreements with the Coast Guard to be auxiliary units of the Coast Guard in these areas as well. So that's more of a formal relationship that's taken place between some communities in the Coast Guard. Um, and then when you think of funding, so I would say through the uh, auxiliary uh, units, there would be some funding that's available through that. But I would say um, I, I also might want to mention um, the DFO program, so the Aboriginal Fishery Guardian Program. Um, I know if Ross were here, that's what he would talk about too, is uh, that the Aboriginal Fishery Guardian Program in the late 80s was a big starter of sort of the modern day understanding of a guardian, right? A modern day guardian program was that was the beginning of it. And, in, and although the DFO is going through a big revamp of that program, there is still um, 
there are uh, still some guardians along the coast that are designated as Aboriginal guardians through that. And that um, many of, well, some of the guardian programs, I shouldn't say many, but there are some guardian programs that have uh, different agreements with DFO to do um, through their, uh, for, through their fisheries agreements to uh, get, receive seasonal funding as well. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Lara, thank you for that. Uh, one more question. Um, has there been any international exposure uh, either to the network or the Coastal Guardian Watchmen specifically? And, uh, and how, how has that uh, been uh, a, a, perhaps an interesting uh, opportunity for cross-fertilization internationally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, very recently, um, myself and uh, Ross, who was supposed to be here today, and then Ernie Talio, who's the guardian coordinator for the Bella Coola uh, Newhawk Guardian Watchman, we presented at the International Marine Conservation Congress. Uh, so it was online, it was supposed to be in Germany, but uh, it was online. So that was the sort of most recent international presentation. Um, previous to that, though, there has been um, a really good relationship between the guardian watchman uh, network, the Coastal Guardian Watchmen, and the um, Northern Australian Indigenous uh, Land and Management uh, group, so the Indigenous Guardian groups in Northern Australia, and we actually had an exchange with them uh, a few years ago as well, where um, a few, few folks from the coast here went to Australia for, I believe it was an International Parks Congress there, and met with rangers, and then the rangers came to the coast as well and, and did a tour up the coast of the Guardian program, so. Mm -hmm. Very promising. Yes, I, I didn't expect that, uh, but that's uh, extraordinary. <laughs> uh, the reach has already made it all the way across the Pacific. That's great. Uh, there is another question here in the chat. Is there an interest in adding biodiversity surveying and monitoring to the program? Uh, biodiversity, sir. Yeah, I think that there is in some. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think when we think about biodiversity surveying and monitoring. Can we be more specific, I guess? I will have to interpret from the person who is asking <laughs> yeah. the question. Uh, basically, long-term monitoring of the kinds of species and their abundance mm -hmm. in this uh, beautiful and sometimes often pristine habitats that the- Yeah, uh, there already, yeah, there definitely already is that going on. So uh, within the regional monitoring system, there's a bunch of different options and forms that the guardians can fill out for wildlife sightings, specific plant sightings, um, and so those are already being tracked. And in general, I mean, I think this speaks also to the climate change question is that when there are particular sightings of animals or species that are um, perhaps unusual or um, that are occurring earlier than previously noted, we also mark that down too, so that we have a way of sort of tracking when there are unusual events that happen. Would you know if that includes invertebrates as well? Like um, no, not for uh, kind of regionally, not for invertebrates, but I do, I think that they are doing some invertebrate sampling just in the central coast sub region. That's great. Again, Alejandro would know more about that than me. That's, he works that's specifically that's that. Absolutely works, Lara. Uh, why don't you allow me to venture into uh, the field of ghost gear? I don't know if uh, everybody around the table is familiar with ghost gear. This is really the really fishing gear. Uh, bits and pieces that either in a storm get detached from the fishing vessel and then end up floating uh, and uh, actually continuing to fish, as it were, creating a tremendous impact on the ecosystem. Uh, there is a global ghost gear initiative, of course, that has been designed specifically to tackle this problem. problem. Uh, I wonder whether ghost gear is something that the Coastal Guardian Watchmen encounter, and then if they do, uh, how do they proceed with it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's definitely something that is encountered. It's a definite issue. Um, oftentimes, hmm, how should I say? So this is something where, again, we get into that enforcement regulation piece, right? So we there are the standard ways of reporting the gear or abandoned fishing gear to, um, to DFO and um, that kind of thing as well. And certain times it is, is, it is taken up. Um, very recently, actually, we have, um, you may have seen it on the, on the news that we have a, a 
kind of coastal cleanup initiative that just has, has launched as well. So in the Central Coast, it was also done in collaboration with the Small Ship Tourism Operators Association, um, but it's also taking place along uh, all of the communities of coastal First Nations, so the Central Coast, North Coast, and in Haida Gwaii, and the Guardians and, and, um, and other kind of um, other workers along the coast are going to be going out and doing a huge cleanup of derelict, uh, derelict gear and marine debris. Um, and so kind of early reports that I've heard from the central coast right now, I mean, I think they, they literally had collected tons of waste off of the shores and probably I've heard something like 50 to 70% of it is derelict fishing gear. So it's a huge, huge issue. And they, um, but it is, um, yeah, it is. That is the work of the Guardians as well. <laughs> Extraordinary and very, very timely. Yes, I saw the press release about these two initiatives that you're mentioning, uh, mm -hmm. the cleanups. And uh, it is just fascinating to see how many more groups are interested in marine debris. Uh, which is one of the key uh, threats to the oceans. Meanwhile, I mean, plastics and uh, and everything else uh, around marine debris continues to be a top priority for ocean wise as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do look forward to learn more. We have the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup Program together with the World Wildlife Fund already operating across Canada. Uh, but we would be very, very keen to look into this, uh, some of which are remote locations and the kind of data that comes in because yeah. of course beyond the actual impact of the removal of the of the plastics and the gear and the marine debris we would like to really understand where it comes from and then yeah. uh, what is it that we can do working upstream with the industries that generate that kind of debris and the consumers and the retailers and whatever is along the chain uh, so that we can really turn off the tap uh, mm -hmm. hopefully uh, and give the oceans a breather Lara, mm -hmm. it's been a fascinating and very uh, informative conversation Thank you ever so much. I would like to uh, more generally congratulate again the Coastal Guardian Watchmen for their incredible work uh, and for this award, which of course we are very honored to, uh, to present to you. Uh, thank you for being with us and for receiving it uh, on their behalf. I'm handing over back to Danica. Wonderful, thank you so much, Carlos. And again, thank you, Laura, it's been a uh, just a wonderful presentation and I've learned so much and it's been great seeing the audience engagements and comments and questions in the chat. So I know that you've really sp like spirited a lot of thought and feeling in all of us today and we really appreciate it. And again, congratulations um, on the award. We're so happy that you could share this with us today. Um, I would like to wrap up our presentation today with a few words about what's coming up next. As I mentioned to start off with, we do have a series of the Ocean Awards lectures so that we can share with you all of the great award recipients and their presentations and their messages. And so coming up next Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, we are going to be so excited to host Danielle Shaw, who's the recipient of the Murray A. Newman Award for Significant Achievement in Aquatic Conservation. And so if you're tuning in today, we really hope that you will join us again next week for that. And you can find the entire schedule of events that are coming up for that series at our Aqua blog that I will just put in the chat here so that everyone has access to that so you can plan the next weeks accordingly. We also want to get the word out because we can have even more people join us for these events. That's the kind of great thing about them being online is that people from anywhere can join in and learn with us. And so we hope that you will help share these events out to your networks. And you can do that by keeping an eye out on our Facebook page. We post our year-long series, Tales from the Deep, which this is kind of a special component of each week, as well as you will find all of the Ocean Awards series posted there as well. And that you can find out all sorts of ways that you can connect to OceanWise conservation research and education by finding us at Ocean 
ocean.org slash learn online, where we post a calendar of all of our live stream events each week. You can connect with us, ask questions, see what's coming up for programs by following us at OceanWise EDU on Twitter and the hashtag OceanWise Research. You may have also seen recently that the Vancouver Aquarium is temporarily closed to the public at this time. And to learn more about that, you can visit the vanaqua.org page. We also would love your support and learning more about the great initiatives that our community are providing to support us by visiting vanaqua.org slash support slash community. And so again, thank you so much to our presenter. Thank you to our audience. And we are looking forward to hopefully seeing you again next week. Bye, thank you.